How many of you know that in the first Sunday of June, half, halfway almost through 2024, <laughs> that our world right now is in a major spiritual battle? I mean, it's so obvious to see what's going on in our country, what's going on in Israel, what's going on all over the world. There's something that's happening not just on the earth, but all around us, and it's so easy to see. I am uh, a native Floridian. I, I grew, grew up in Florida, uh, northwest Florida. Gulf Breeze, Pensacola was, was where I was born. Um, I've been married for 46 years, going on 47, if my wife keeps me this rest of this year. <laughs> um, we have three grown children, and they all live within 10 15 minutes of our home, and they have reproduced themselves, and they have 14 kids all together. So they range from uh, 15 years old down to the youngest is three months old. So, so they're all, they were just over recently for Memorial Day, and um, it, was, it was an adventure. It was, it was, it was amazing. Uh, I want to want to share a little bit. When when my kids were growing up, I used to tell them a little story. I made up a bedtime story for. I have two sons and one daughter. The daughter's in the middle. Her name is Jenny, and there's there's Neil and there's Ryan. And I just made up a story. I, I didn't come from a a Christian home. I, my my parents weren't believers. I didn't grow up in the church. I got pretty radically saved at the age of about eighteen or nineteen. My older brother was a pro surfer. He and I used to surf all that. We used to come down to Cocoa Beach all the time and surf. He, he became a pro surfer. I got saved. He got saved. But I went off to Bible College in Lakeland, Florida, then off to a Baptist seminary and planted a church in my own hometown in 1983. So I've been there 40, 40 years and um, transitioning it to my son, my oldest son right now. But I used to tell my kids this story, a bedtime story that I made up. Uh, the two boys would be in one room, and Jenny had her own room. And I, I told them this story about um, this frog named Roscoe the River Frog that I made up. And Roscoe lived way, way, way up in a tree. And every day, every time they'd go to bed, I'd say, well, you know, Roscoe would walk down the tree, walk, 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 walk. You'd drag this out because you're trying to get him to go to sleep, right? Walk, 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 walk. Then he'd walk all the way over to our house. Walk, 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 walk. And then he would knock on the door. And I'd ask the question, who do you think answered the door? Well, they would start naming off. Of course, I didn't know who answered the door. I just let them drag it out for as long as they could. they name every person they knew, every, you know, relative. And finally, I said, no, it was Aunt Susie. Aunt Susie, she was here. Yeah, she was here. She answered the door. And then the, basically the rest of the story would be this, that he would kind of relive the, their day, whatever they did that day. They played outside. They went to the park. They went to the beach. You know, Roscoe went with them here. He did, whatever they did that day, he relived the whole day. And then at the end of it, I would say, and then Roscoe was so tired after a day like that that all he wanted to do was go to sleep. So now I want you to go to sleep. Not, not you guys. My, my, my kids. And then he would walk, 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 all the way back to the top of the tree and fall asleep. Well, what I always did with my daughter, which I didn't do with my sons, I don't know why, when I'd, then I'd go in her room and tell her the same story. But right at the end of it, I would say, Jenny, you know, if I could line up all the little girls in the world, and I would name off our friends, Natalie and Stacy and, you know, Mary, all the little girls that were in her class, all the little girls that she hung out with, all her cousins. I'd say, if I could line all of them up and I could just pick one to be my daughter, then she'd be laying there, her eyes would really, and I'd put my finger right in the middle of her forehead and I'd say, Jenny, I would pick you. And she would smile and she would laugh and, and I'd pray for her. And in some ways, I, I believe this, 
that God has divinely, purposely, lovingly, graciously, if you're one of his kids, he has placed his finger right on your forehead and said, I choose you. And not only have I chosen you to be my child, my son, my daughter, but I've chosen you to be a part of my family, my church. And I want to talk a little bit this morning about why the church. It, the Bible describes it as the bride of Christ. Jesus said, I'll build my church. He, he said that in, in the book of Revelation that he stands in the midst of his church. And, and I like to ask this question, and it's a good one to, to roll around in your head, is what if everyone in this church, if, the, if you're a part of this church, what if everyone in this church was just like you? What if everyone prayed like you or served like you or gave like you or attended like you or what was, was involved like you? What if everyone in Calvary Chapel, Merritt Island was just like you? What, what would the church be like? The church. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you've heard it said, I like Jesus, but I'm not too crazy about the church. <laughs> Some people feel that way. You know, the church is compromised, or it's about this person or that person, or I was hurt by the church, or I was offended by the church, or, or you know, the thief on the cross didn't need the church. Why do I need the church? So I, I want to start off in the book of Ephesians. If you have a Bible, I'm going to start with Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19, where it... Where Actually, Paul is talking about the church and how it's being built together. In verse 19, Ephesians 2, it says, Now, therefore, you're no longer strangers, foreigners, but fellow members, fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles, the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God's Spirit. And then he goes on to, to, to say some amazing things in chapter 3. He says in verse 5, In other ages it was not made known to the souls of men as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles are also a part of the body, partakers of his promise through the gospel, which I became a minister according to the gift of grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. To me, he says, less than the least of all the saints this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and make all see... And listen to this, what is the fellowship of the mystery which was from the beginning of ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in heaven and places according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. God has always had in his heart the church. It's not an afterthought. It's not something that he said, oh, I better do something now that uh, mankind has fallen. It's part of God's eternal purpose. The church was and always is in the heart of God. And I want to ask you to kind of go back with me, if you will, in time all the way back to the creation story. This is, this is kind of man is in the garden and everything's created. Everything's been designed. All the plants, all the water, all the stars, all the universe and, and the animals. And, and, and God looks at it all. And God says, it's good. It's, it's very good. But one thing was not good as God looked on the face of the earth. He says, it's not good that man be what? Alone. So God created woman. He created Eve. 
And when he created Eve, everything changed. Now there's marriage. It's the beginning of family. It's really the beginning of community and culture, and now relationships have begun. It's a whole different planet. Society is going to emerge. And, and there came that day when Adam and Eve chose to disobey. You know the story. They ate the fruit that they were not supposed to eat, the forbidden fruit, and it brought these deadly, tragic consequences into our world. Sin enters the picture. And the result is twofold. There's spiritual death, separation between man and God. They're forced out. They're cast out of the garden. They're hiding. God comes looking for them, so to speak. And there is brokenness. There's pain and there's hurt. And the relationship between man and God is now different. It also brought a relationship change between Adam and Eve. Now there's blame. Adam blamed his wife. Imagine blaming your wife for something, something husbands never do. Eve blamed the serpent. There was an understanding of, of, of nakedness and tension that had arisen among the first married couple. And, and as you follow the story, the first family, they have children. They have two boys. Now, we're in the, the very embryonic stages of creation, and they're, they're, they've, they've eaten the fruit. They've sinned. There's tension between them and God and one another. They have these two sons. And sibling rivalry erupts. There's, there's this conflict between the two of them. Anger and jealousy and resentment. Cain, Cain and Abel are struggling. And, and in the midst of the conflict, it leads to the very first homicide in the world. So, so Cain is, is, is separated from his family now. And he begins a new community. He builds his own city. And now you have the alienation of family and culture. Communities are starting over in a different way. And it's amazing, isn't it, how fast a culture can change. You ever see any changes in our culture that we're living in? And how quickly things can change. Look how fast it happened here. You've got these two people living in paradise, suddenly they're cast out, and now they have children, and the children are at odds with one another, and now one of them kills his own brother, and he, he moves away, starts his own culture, so to speak. And by the time you get to just six chapters into the very book of Genesis, the creation story, you're only six chapters into it, it says this. In verse 12 of chapter 6, so God looked upon the earth, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Wait a minute. We were just in paradise six chapters ago. Everything was great. Now, six chapters later... God is, is looking down on the face of earth and saying, it, it, it has to be destroyed. Now, now stay with me. Fr fr from there, we, we have Noah. Communities spread out. New issues and difficulties continue to grow. And some decided at a certain time, we need a mutual collective sense of security as, as the earth began to populate. So they began to migrate eastward to a place called Babel. And they built this, this huge city and established their own culture and independent from God. They rejected him and they built this huge tower. And God intervenes. And he does it in a very interesting way. God brings a confusion of languages. And people found themselves unable to communicate as a whole. Different languages and, and different groups began to spread out across the earth, north, south, east, west. And, and now you have more alienation between people than you've ever had before. 
establishing different cultures and separation across the world. And, and here's the pattern. Listen, disobedience, sin enters the world, there's separation between God and man, and there's separation from each other. Division, tension. From the very first couple, from the very first family, to judgment, confusion of languages, establishment of diverse cultures. But the two main issues remain. Separation from God and alienation, separation from each other. And so there's this need, this, this, this desire for, for restoration to be restored to God and, I believe, to be restored to one another. And God has always had this plan. Listen. So God raises up this individual. You know the story. His name is Abraham. He says, Abraham, look up into the sky, and I, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make your lineage, your heritage, like the stars in the sky. That's how big your family will be. That's how large your descendants will be. And, and it's very foggy at first to Abraham. It's not very clear. And, and God begins to carry out this plan. And, and through Abraham's seed... A Messiah is born, Jesus, a light to all nations, a light to the world. And in the gospel story, he becomes that sacrifice to, to restore, to bring those who have sinned back to the Lord, to be washed, to be cleansed. For all those who believe and receive, and he He's crucified on a cross. He rises from the dead. And, and something amazing happens. I, I want to read it to you. It's from the book of Acts, chapter 2. They were gathered together there on the day of Pentecost. You know this story. It says, There appeared to them divided tongues of fire on, on each of them, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with tongues. And then there's this amazing verse, Acts 2, verse 5. Listen to this. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews and devout men from every nation under heaven. That's what it says. And, and when the sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. They're all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, are, are these who speak not Galileans, how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? And then he starts to describe them all, Parthians and Medes and Eliamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, parts of Libya joining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans, even Arabs. We hear them speaking in our own tongues, the wonderful works of God, and they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? Every nation under heaven, Jews, proselytes, all nationalities and cultures, Egypt, Libya, African, Asia, India, China, Arabs, on the day of Pentecost, God brings all these nations and all these people together a huge representation of races, and the Spirit of God is poured out as Peter preaches the gospel. They hear the message of Jesus Christ in their own language, and that day, God is birthing the church, a, a, a whole new creation, a whole new culture, a whole new people. And from the very first day of the church being born, you cross all barriers of race, language, color, and culture. And God brings them not only into relationship with himself, but he also brings them in relationship to one another. And he does something, I like to call it backwards Babel, or the opposite of what happened in Babel. God brings not only people to himself through this allowing them to hear languages that they knew themselves and the people who spoke them didn't know them. And he brings people into relationship with the Lord and with one another 
And the church is born, listen, despite language barriers, despite custom, despite background, despite culture, whoever calls on his name, the name of Jesus, will be saved. And that's why here in the New Testament, there's neither Jew, nor slave, nor Greek, nor freeman, all one in Jesus Christ. See, see, we're all different. We're, we're, we're socially, economically, culturally, racially, red states, blue states, black, white, whatever it might be. But I would submit to you that those are all side issues as we come together in Jesus Christ. He, he makes a whole new people. He, 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 people who, are, who, who come to the foot of the cross to be forgiven and brought back into relationship with God. And we discover this amazing thing called the family of God, the, the, the unity that we have together in Jesus Christ. I, I'm from Northwest Florida. I grew up there. Raised in Pensacola, Gulf Breeze. I'm an hour from Alabama. So I'm from the South. I can remember driving in Mobile, Alabama and seeing the, the sign, Governor George Wallace, thinking, wow. And, and, and I'm pretty much as Southern as you can be. On one of my first trips to San Diego in 1969 or 70, we went out there to surf and I uh, met this guy who became a longtime friend of ours. And I, I think I used to pronounce Gulf Breeze Guff. And my, 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 my San Diegan friend said, is it Guff Breeze or Gulf Breeze? I said, I think it's Guff. But, but here's the thing. I have more in common with an ice fisherman from Minnesota who knows Jesus and is part of his church than I do with someone born in my own hometown who doesn't know Christ and who isn't a surfer. Because it's amazing. You travel across the world, you meet people who are believers, and it feels like in the first 20 minutes that you talk to them because of the same salvation experience, because of the same spirit that's within you, because of the same love for Christ and the heart for people, you feel like you've known them forever. Yeah. Why is that? It's because of what God's done. Not only has He restored us to Himself, but He's restored us to one another. That, that, that's part of the reason for, for, for the church. All the external differences... Money and education and language and hobbies and race and culture are all external issues that one day, listen, one day will completely disappear. And your true identity and salvation in Christ will last for all eternity. That's who we are. In Revelation chapter 19, there's a wonderful uh, few verses that that talk about what happens when we get to heaven. It says, after these things, I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments because he has judged the great harlot and corrupted the earth with her fornication and he has avenged on her the blood of his servants. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a multitude, the sound of many waters, as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad, let us rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife, the church, has made herself ready. God, God reconciles men and women to himself from every nation, from every culture, from every tribe and tongue and to each other, into his body, the church. And, and it's powerful. That, that's his plan. That's his purpose. Locally, globally. And here's the thing. Money can't do it. Government can't do it. The United Nations can't do it. The world councils can't do it. No amount of political power or influence will do it. The diversity in which we are one is an expression of the awesome wisdom, power, and the glory of our God and His grace. Only He can do this. 
Only God can take people who are so different and from so many different backgrounds, and he demonstrates it on the very day that the church is born, where they're from every tribe and nation. They're there and go, how is it that we hear this, this in our own language? And God says, because I'm doing something that has never been done before. I'm birthing something called the church, my bride. And I'm restoring people not only to myself, but to one another. Jesus said this, by, all, by this all men will know that you're my disciples, that you're a Republican. No, he didn't say that. <laughs> I didn't hear him say that. Did you hear him say that? He said that you have love one for another. That, that's the unifying factor. See, see, it doesn't matter your skin color, your educational background, if you're fit, if you're disabled, you're, you're welcome into the body of Christ. Tall, short, young, old, hipster, nerd, married, single, Jew, Gentile, and you can't find this anywhere else in the world. It's only in the church. It's the work of the power of the Holy Spirit and the grace of God demonstrated through His Son, Jesus Christ, and the preaching of the gospel. Why the church? Well, it's an external, eternal, Holy Spirit-empowered expression of God connecting us to Himself and to each other. Our unity is not in race, it's not in music, it's not in birthplace, it's not in culture. Our unity is found together in Jesus Christ. That's who we are. In, in many church growth movements, you get all kinds of literature on email and in the mail, and you, you hear all these different ways to reach people, or, or we're going after the young professionals, or we're going after married couples, or we're going after a certain zip code, or some narrow slice of the cultural pie. And I know every church has its own culture, its own style, but that represents our limitations, not our successes. He's called us to be one, to come together. The beauty of the church is what makes us one, and that's Jesus. That's the beauty of it. Don't ever give up on the church. The church is central to God's eternal purpose, and the church also, I would submit to you, has an amazing future. Listen to Ephesians chapter 5. I'll just read, well, I'll just read two verses that he might sanctify and cleanse her, with the washing and the water of the word, and that he might present her, speaking of the church, to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. That's the church. It has this amazing future. It has an eternal purpose. And you might say, yeah, but John, the church has problems. It has uh, opposition. People, the government, the courtrooms, the schools. Well, I agree. But, but maybe you've heard this story. And bear with me as I share it. It's a story about a... a, a A mom who had two ugly daughters and a beautiful stepdaughter. But the stepdaughter was treated unfairly. She, she did all the work, all the chores, all the cleaning, all the washing. She wore old, worn-out clothes. She had to sleep on the hearth by the fireplace in the kitchen to stay warm. And she was covered all the time with soot and cinders. And they called her Cinderella. You guys heard this story? I'm not making this up. <laughs> so, so, so one day, the king decided to throw this giant ball for all the fair maidens in his kingdom to find a wife for his prince. Well, the ugly sisters were all excited. They bought new gowns, new shoes. They did their hair. They, they were going to the ball. But Cinderella? No, Cinderella, you can't go. You don't have a dress. All you have is rags. You have to stay here and work. You know the story. Fairy godmother shows up, carriage from a pumpkin. Mice become horses and footmen. She has a gorgeous dress, beautiful glass slippers. She enters the ball, and the prince is, well, he's, he's smitten. He's awestruck. 
he dances with Cinderella all night long until midnight. And as the story goes, the, the magic or whatever it was to, was to, to wear out or run out at midnight, and it began to chime, and she runs out and leaves a glass slipper behind. And the prince is devastated. And he looks all through the kingdom from house to house, village to village, till he finally gets to Cinderella's house. And he's been trying this slipper on every woman he can. And out come the two ugly stepsisters. And he's going to put the, you know, he's going to put the slipper, but their feet are a little pudgy and you know, can't get them on. So it's not them. Ah, oh, it's failed again. And out comes Cinderella. In the perfect time, in the perfect place, he slips it on. And it's her destiny. For the rest of her life, she will be in the palace with the prince. And he came for her, just her. It's somewhat like the church. People ignore it. They persecute it. They, want, they don't want to hear from it. During certain pandemics, they want to shut it down. But you know what? They devalue it. But Christ loves the church. And he's coming for the church. And it'll have no spot, no blemish. See, today we see the, the church with all its spots, with all its blemishes, with all its wrinkles, with all its imperfections. But one day, you and I will be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. No spots, no wrinkles, completely whole. You know, as I've gotten older, I, I've, I've noticed some spots and some wrinkles. Just think about that one day. <laughs> no spots, no wrinkles. The church. And it'll be joy in the Father's house because, listen, the church has an eternal purpose. It has a great and amazing destiny and future. And Christ loves the church. Be careful how you treat her, how you speak about her, how you participate in her. The church is his great gift that he gave himself for. And, and how can we not love and give ourselves to his church? I asked the question at the beginning, what if everyone treated the church just like you? God loves the church. He uses the church. He places people with all kinds of gifts and, and callings in the church. And he desires for all of us who have come to Christ to be a functioning part of the church, the body of Christ. You know, I, I, I like to use this illustration sometimes. I was speaking one Sunday, and afterwards I, I was standing down front talking to people, and this guy came up to me, and he goes, Pastor John, uh, would you be willing to meet with my father-in-law? And I go, I don't know. Does your father-in-law want to meet with me? He goes, yeah, I've been giving him uh, your messages. He's been listening to him, and he'd really like to talk to you. I go, um, what does he want to talk about? He goes, he's dying. I said, oh. I said, well, is he a Christian? He goes, no, he, he, he won't go to church anywhere, never has. But he, he, he says he likes your messages, and, and he would love for you to come by. So I set up a meeting. I went by his house. I, I went in, and just he and I were there. And immediately I knew he was dying. He had jaundice in his eyes. Skin was kind of yellow. He was very thin. And we had some small talk there for a few minutes. And, and then I asked him, I said, uh, do you believe in heaven? He goes, oh, yeah, yeah, I believe in heaven. I go, oh. I said, well, are you going to heaven? He goes, no, I'm not going to heaven. I said, well, what about your son-in-law? Do you think he's going to heaven? He goes, oh, yeah, my son-in-law, he loves the Lord. He reads his Bible. He's a great husband to my daughter and great father to my grandsons, and he loves Jesus. He says, there's no doubt in my mind that my son-in-law is going to heaven. Well, what about your daughter? Is she going to heaven? He said all these great things about his daughter. Oh, yeah, she's this, she's that. She loves the Lord. She, she quotes the Bible to me. She prays for me. He goes, there's no doubt in my mind that my daughter 
going to heaven. I said, well, why aren't you going to heaven? He goes, well, because I can't believe all that stuff in the Bible. I go, like what stuff? He goes, you know, the Noah and the ark and the animals. He goes, come on. Moses parting a, a sea with a stick. He goes, Jonah, you know, swallowed by a fish. He goes, that's all fairy tales. He goes, I can't believe that. I said, really? He goes, yeah. I said, well, let me ask you a question. Who told you you had to believe in Jonah to go to heaven? Or Moses or Noah? He's like, what? I said, who told you you had to believe in those guys to get to heaven? He goes, well, I, th I thought I had to believe the, that stuff in the Bible to go to heaven. I said, well, well, when I came to the Lord, I didn't know anything about the Bible. All I knew was I needed to be forgiven. I said, do you believe in Jesus? He goes, oh, yeah, I believe Jesus was a real person. I said, do you believe he died on the cross for your sins? He goes, yeah. I said, well, have you ever received Jesus as your Savior? He goes, no. I said, would you like to? Now, don't, don't misunderstand. I believe in the inerrancy of the Bible from the very first page to the last. I said, so have you ever received Jesus? He goes, he goes, no. I said, would you like to? He said, I would. So, so I prayed with him, and, and, and he received the Lord. And about two months later, I did his memorial service. But before I left his house that night, this is what I said to him. Don't be surprised when you get to heaven if you see Jonah <laughs> and Noah <laughs> and Moses. And, and something amazing happened before he died. People in our church heard about his situation and the meals that were taken over there and the prayer that was given and the relationships that he made and the funeral that occurred because he became a part of the body of Christ, the family. It was mind-boggling. Well, when people heard that, you know, so-and-so's father-in-law and so-and-so's -so father got saved and that he was going to be dying, uh, they just began to pray. They just began to serve. They just began to gather. And God did something beautiful. Not only did he restore this man back to himself, but he restored him to people and to a family called the church. See, see what if everybody in the church was just like you? What would the church be like? God, God, God has established the church. It has an eternal purpose. It has an amazing future. And God loves the church and wants to use the church. And he's placed you and I in the church. Not only did he just restore us to himself, but thank the Lord he restored us to one another. Amen? Amen. Let's stand together. Lord, I, I thank you for the church, for the, the amazing thing that you have done. You've saved us. But you didn't just save us to, to be all alone with you. Lord, you, you saved us to put us into a body, into a family. And Lord, I would pray if there's anyone here today that doesn't know you, that's not been restored to you and brought into the family, that today would be a day when they would bow their heart and head and ask you to come into their life. Lord, thank you so much for salvation in Jesus Christ. And thank you so much for allowing us to be a part of this wonderful thing called the church. Help us to serve, love, and be the best we can within it for the time we have together. Lord, we ask it, we pray it in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen.